Welcome again to our program, Going Beyond. And it's my great pleasure to welcome into our studio today, Dr. Oscar Nigley. Now, Dr. Nigley was a professor of economics at Loyola College for many, many years. He's since moved into the area of research and he guides PhD students. He's also been an MLA in the Tamil Nadu Assembly and he's had two terms in that post. And he is also very, very active with his work in the Anglo-Indian community, Senior Vice President at the All India level. And so it's my very great pleasure to welcome you, Oscar, here. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you so much. I, I, I it's know a you're, joy. I know it's, you're a very yeah. busy person. Now, yeah. you've given up full-time teaching. You were very well known as an economics professor. Now, tell me about this new role of yours. Do you like it? I mean, uh, you know, guiding students, doing research. What is your yes, research about? because I was already doing research, but basically trying to uh, help students uh, to finish their PhD or even any the research work to present papers, to write out papers. Because one of the things we have to move away is from pure academics of just writing an examination, but also preparing projects, doing uh, preparing papers. And that's the emphasis in our country, which is not really adequate. Right. Whereas in any any other part of the world, right from school, they start uh, paper presentation, they start projects. So the, the thinking levels are much higher because the originality is higher rather than just, you know, rote memory. Right. And but you yourself are actually uh, going around the world in different places and you are uh, teaching uh, yeah. as a freelance professor. So have you found a marked difference in the way students need to be handled overseas and over here? Very much because one thing is here the problem is students, they are very good, they are very academically oriented but they don't really um, you know, analyze things and ask questions. Some of them, you get a minority, yes, but majority prefer to remain just quiet. You don't ask me a question, I don't ask you a question. So, it's the, that's the general attitude. Whereas, in other parts of the world where they really, it's, it's expensive first. Education is extremely mm. expensive. Right. So, every R matters for them. Every R is money. Uh, so, what they do is, and we give them the material before our lectures. So, they prepare go through the material and they come fully prepared. So a professor also when he goes to a class, he himself has to be thorough with what he has, what he's talking about. You can't talk half big things. So you should know because they're going to ask you questions. They're going to question you on what, in the sense that they're going to ask you questions which are genuine. And if you know it, you it's very easy yes. to answer. But Dr. Nigli, do you not believe that some of the fault also has to go to the way uh, a professor like yourself, I'm not saying you, but uh, the way a professor inspires uh, a young Absolutely. person. Absolutely. You, you use the right word, you need to inspire people. Yes. And how you inspire people is first of all, your ability to communicate Absolutely. and your knowledge of the subject and how you're able to make people understand. Now, in a subject like economics, very often people don't understand you know, at the school level, they say it's a dry subject. I tell them, what is dry? I was you going pour, to say if that you pour water on it, it becomes wet. <laughs> so the, the dryness is here nothing to do with the, the subject of being, it's the most challenging subject. If you look at the country itself, we've had two, uh, we've had uh, Manmohan Singh, who was an economist, Prime yes. Minister, we had Montek Singh Ahulawalia, we've had great economists in India, and it's everything to do with the country, it's everything to do with growth, it's everything to do with development. But what's happening is here, the, the way it is exposed, the teachers, some of them, particularly the school level, it is all very, very, you know, uh, stereotyped. So students have a kind of an aversion. They're not able to understand what it is. So they make uh, easy subject difficult. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. Right. So that is the problem. If we do that at the school level, then they will have an interest. And in when they come to college, same thing even at the college level, not every professor will be able to take the subject and do it because he needs to inspire people and needs them to understand. Because mm -hmm. there are different levels of students. Yes, of course. And you, you know, you, you can't just go on delivering boring lectures. You need to also uh, relate to students, try to understand their issues and then give live examples. I always believe that. Yeah. Give examples from the country, tell them this is what it is, this is your subject, this is what you're learning and this is exactly what's happening in the country. So you see how you apply it. Yes. Uh, Tell me, Dr. Nigli, what is your research all about? I mean, in economics, what what is it that you are actually looking at? See, what I've already been working on is actually state finances and subsidies and how it operates and what happens, the leakages in the system. Because you know, one of the things we have in our own state, Tamil Nadu, there is a huge amount of subsidies. But the problem is how much of these subsidies are really reaching out to the poorest of the poor. Right. So unless you, how do you plug those leakages? So that's what we're trying to focus on and trying to make people understand that there is a huge uh, um, gap between the actual delivery 
system, this delivery system itself has too many lacunae, too much of loopholes in the right. system. So that is why we need to work on and see how. But And for that, of course, you'll have to really make it transparent, which is very hard. It has to be corrupt-free, which is again a big very issue as, as far as we are concerned. Right. So unless you address it, so the only thing is to change young minds. But then the, the issue is how are we going to make them understand this? So therefore, and then again, the other problem in research is plagiarism. One of the average, because from very young, I told you abroad, they, they start with paper presentation, they start with research work, they have to write a project. So the idea of plagiarism doesn't strike them because they know how to do it. Here what happens, we are exposed to research probably mostly at the end of the undergraduate level or in many, many cases at the postgraduate level, very minimal. They'll have one project for one semester. So what happens, the tendency is, I don't know how to go about doing it. So what do I do? The best thing is pull out Pull it out place. from somebody else. Now, when you do research, I often think about the end result. I mean, when you are talking about, say, for instance, state finances or the country's finances, you've got to give that to somebody to use. So are the powers that be actually receptive? If you went, for instance, and said, this is wrong, this is what can be altered, this is what can be improved on. Honestly, that normally doesn't happen because, unfortunately, as some uh, one philosopher said, mm. it's not what you know, it's whom you know. I know, unfortunately, yeah. sadly, uh, yeah. that's very sad. So whom? So you need to be able to have the right contacts. You should be able to reach out to people. Only then it works. So if if it's not just about being a scholar, indeed, it's it's about having the contacts in that particular area in which the only then you are you are taken on. Right now, your scholarly pursuits. Which are the countries that you actually go to to teach other students? Tell uh, me. To France, really? to Singapore, and to Australia, and the UK. These are the I've I've stopped with that. <laughs> That's almost half the world. <laughs> not the US. Not the US. <laughs> not the US. Not yet, I'm sure. But of all of these countries, uh, which do you like the best in terms of uh, their whole education system, and what you're imparting to them? I enjoyed my stints in France. It was, really? it was very nice and and one thing is of course although everybody speaks French but they, I was they going to say. yeah in in the masters they had it was in English so I had that advantage there and uh, they really took it very seriously the students also took it very seriously right. the same thing even with UK of course UK as well was quite interesting because I even had a batch of Chinese students. In, so in a whole whole lot of them would come from China because now the usual thing is now to uh, to, to learn English, you know. When other countries where uh, everybody wants to focus on English, mm. so of course English means you, the best thing is go to UK and you learn your economics there as well. So it, it's it's a double advantage. Right now, in terms of your research, I guess there's never really an end for a person like yourself to uh, to stop doing no, research. No, never, never, never. Like, yeah, research is like a learning process. You, you, you can never claim that you finished everything. Right. So it, it's an ongoing, continuous process and there are so many things which probably one will not cover in one's lifetime right. because it's, it's so huge and so vast. But then you make that effort to whatever areas you can and try to specialize in some particular areas. Right. Your research, of course, continues at Loyola where you have been for just so long. So how often do you have to go in very often or how, do, how does no, it work? Uh, it, it's, 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 it's very flexy. The main thing is my focus on making these students finish their PhD because that's extremely important to me. For example, even now I'm handling a student who is on the verge, he's uh, ready with his thesis, submitted his synopsis and probably it's a matter of a few months now. He, in, interesting cases, his mother is, he doesn't have a father and his mother is a casual laborer earning 60 rupees a day. How wonderful. Yeah, I mean, and she, she wouldn't know what a PhD is. Her son is getting a PhD, she wouldn't even know. She only knows that he studied something very high. But that's about it. This is the grit of this boy. And I'm, I'm doing going all out to see that he... And it's, it's a matter of time before he finishes. Right. You must be an amazing, uh, you know, PhD guide for, for a lot of young students. Because one often reads and hears about the trouble that a PhD guy does give to students yes, nowadays. Yes, yes, Why? Yes. What's the problem? The, the, the problem is very simple. You know, if you apply the law of economics, what do I get by doing this? I get nothing. So you need to have uh, a social responsibility. A wanting to do it. Of wanting to help people. One. And secondly, also to make others somebody in life. Others, the usual thing is that the, the, the man, the average human being is very selfish. Indeed. You know, see, I, I don't want anybody else to, to, to progress. To be, yes, to be a PhD. That's one of the reasons why in India we, we don't have too many, in many colleges, you don't have many PhDs because of this. Many of them attempt, they register, 
uh, in, uh, in many departments, you'll see most of them register and, and they, they don't drop finish. away, right? Yes, they drop away. They drop, they drop, and they, they don't finish. They retire. They retire after that. That's terrible. Without having finished their PhD. Uh, that, that's such a sad reflection on us as a society. Yeah. Well, Oscar, I'm going to ask you to hang on for just a very short while. We'll take a very quick break here on Going Beyond, and then we're going to get right back with you. Please don't go anywhere.